1.8 million people. That is the number of Uyghur individuals who we believe are held right now in the internment camps in China. That's one of every 10 Uyghurs. They are in more than 1,000 concentration camps. This subject is not new. Radio Free Asia, where I work, began exposing the mass detentions in China's Uyghur region in 2017. And the other news outlets around the world soon verified our reports. And groups and governments have raised concerns about the topic. But the reality remains. Mega Rijagopalan, two years ago, right here at the Oslo Freedom Forum, asked, does the rest of the world care enough to act on this? Do we? And the question continues to be asked in different ways, in different places. What happens next? The fate of an entire ethnic group, an entire people living in China's far west rests on the answer. The well-being of people like me, Uyghurs outside of China's relatives back home, also rests on it. What happens next? I have, in my way, tried to help telling the stories of those powerless to speak freely, to share their situations with each other and the world. Me, my colleagues at Radio Free Asia, and the numerous of journalists have worked to expose the abuses that would otherwise be silenced by China's state control media and CCP authorities. Let me share my personal story, how I became a journalist working far, far away from homeland and family. My career in journalism started at China's state-run Xinjiang TV, where I created the first children programs for the Uyghur children. It was instantly popular, and I became well-known by Uyghurs and recognized on Chinese radio and on TV in commercials music videos, and movies. But when I traveled to Europe in 2001, I heard the real, uncensored Uyghur history on Radio Free Asia for the first time. I suddenly realized my job, which I loved, had little to do with journalism and everything to do with China's state-run propaganda. I felt guilty for lying to my own people and that I felt used by Chinese government. I decided then and there to escape and work for Radio Free Asia in the United States. It was the most painful decision I ever made in my life. As I was warned, it would put my family at risk, but I couldn't lie anymore. When I first arrived in the US, I had nobody. I had lost of all my achievements in China and I didn't speak any English. I went from being somebody to being a nobody. But deep inside, I was happy because I was free and I would never again contribute to the structure of lies that keeps the Chinese tyranny in power. During my first broadcast without a studio name and RFA, I instantly reconnected with my audience back home. Uyghurs in Xinjiang still recognize my voice. Almost immediately, China banned my old recordings in China. Security service harassed my family and friends, interrogating, threatening, and forcing others to cut ties with my family. The Chinese government sees foreign media such as RFA as a threat, 
because we are exposing Chinese government's lies. It was a difficult time for me. What kept me strong was that in my mind, I could hear my father's voice from my childhood reassuring me, choose freedom for yourself and be a voice for freedom. He was the one who taught me to boldly tell the truth on the international stage. He was the one who encouraged me not to return for my own safety. The one who provided me my moral compass and instilled in me the necessity of being voice for my people when their voices are silenced. In 2017, the Chinese government's crackdown on Uyghurs intensified. In September 2017, Xinjiang Security Service took my brothers to concentration camp. They told my parents it was because of my reporting. China's Security Service tried to take away my American freedom and ensure my silence by holding members of my family hostage. They wanted me to stop reporting and even to return to my homeland to be silenced. Instead, I continued my reporting and I did more. My focus became the disappearances, crackdowns on religion freedom, the installation of an Aurelian mass surveillance police state. I even testified in Congress. As I testify before you today, it grieves me to know and to say that my parents remained under threat and more than two dozen of my relatives in China are missing. Almost certainly held in called re-education camps run by Chinese government. They round up dozens of my family members in January 2018, and they took my parents to the camps too. After my testimony in Congress, several congressmen wrote a letter to Beijing to demand my family's release. Thanks to the intervention of these legislators, most of my family are free today. Unfortunately, my story is not unique. There are millions of Uyghurs like me who are separated from their families, and I am trying my best to tell their stories through my job as a journalist. You all know the horrible crimes against Uyghurs already, the issues have been news headlines for years. Millions of Uyghurs are kept in concentration camps for no reason other than the fact that they are Uyghurs. There is widespread violence against Uyghur women. They are forced to undergo abortions and even sterilization. Uyghurs are abused as forced laborers and worked in factories where they made thousands of products for exports. The Chinese government exports to other countries its high-tech mass surveillance systems. The government intentionally separates Uyghur children from their parents. The leaked China cables. Xinjiang papers. And the Karkash documents all detail the terrible human rights abuses the Chinese government is undertaking. It is crystal clear from its agenda that the ultimate goal of the Chinese government is to completely eliminate the culture, language, religion, and the identity of Uyghurs in China. So let me remind you of the question that needs to be answered. What happens next? Earlier this year, the U.S. Holocaust Museum held an event with members of U.S. Congress, journalists, and human rights advocates about the mass detentions and the treatment of Uyghurs and Chinese Muslim minorities in China's Uyghur region. The speakers railed around a familiar cry, never again, recognizing that this situation there has only worsened since it was first exposed by me and my colleagues in order for the praise never again to be truthful, we have to answer what happens next. The good news is that every person can participate in the answer. Human rights groups and advocates 
have the identified concrete action that the world can take. These actions, when taken by the global community, would end complicity by putting its money where it counts. Do not buy the wigs made of Uyghur women's hair that was shaved off their heads when they entered the concentration camps. Do not let China be the world's leading telecoms producer, while 12 million Uyghurs in China are not allowed to use telephones to connect to the outside world. Do not buy clothes and electronics made by Uyghur forced labor. Do not allow China total exemption in manufacturing from any due delegates in Xinjiang. What happens next? The U.S. government has finally begun taking some actions. And there are now calls inside the European Union and the Australian government to impose sanctions on China. What happens next? For those of us watching the slow motion cultural genocide of the Uyghur people, if nothing happens next, then the answer is known by everyone has studied history or visited any of the Holocaust museums. Do you value freedom enough to say never again? To the atrocities facing millions of my people, the Uyghurs, or will the appeal of China's market power by your silence and inaction until your own freedoms are targeted? Urge you to determine for yourself what your answer will be. What role will you play? What happens next?